All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to my TED Talk uh, today. I'll be talking about something that's uh, relatively easy to relate to and think about, which is uh, home security. So a little bit about myself. I'm Tony Bum. I'm a fourth year CPE, the social chair for White Hat. And uh, I like making music with my band. It's pretty fun. And I'm here because I love giving presentations. It's my favorite pastime. So here's a table of contents, just to go over uh, the five thing, these five things. The first one will be uh, home security systems. And then after that, we'll be going over smart home security automation. Uh, the difference between the two is just that um, in the second section, it'll be about smart, smart home security system, well, security systems that are integrated into your smart home. So like through your phone, you'll be able to interact with your lights and your thermostat and stuff like that. Um, and then after that, we'll be going through the circuitry, uh, non-CPE majors beware, and uh, different flaws that uh, have happened through different security systems in the past, and um, some general safety tips uh, to keep in mind. All right, the first section, uh, this will be an informative section on the different types of systems you can install yourself on any home. All right, uh, here's a little quote. If you can protect your dome, you can protect your home. Tony Bone, modern philosopher. He's a cool guy. That's not me, I don't drink wine. So this one's the Ring floodlight camera. You can uh, see, hear, and speak to visitors from your cell phone or your tablet or computer. Uh, you can monitor your home in 1080 HD. It has uh, infrared vision uh, at night and uh, built-in ultra bright floodlights and motion detect siren. Um, my favorite part about this system is the infrared night vision capability. I think it's pretty cool. All right, this one's the Arlo Pro 3. It uh, shoots high quality 2K video, has auto night vision and low light, uh, weather resistant for indoor and outdoor use, and it has customizable alerts from your smartphone lock screen. And uh, I'd say my favorite thing about this is uh, the weather, res weather resistant aspect um, because you know, uh, for me personally, I like to save money on my systems. So I'd rather them not be breaking do something stupid like the weather. You know, it's like if you're going to have a security camera, it's going to be outside. It better be weatherproof. Um, this one's the Nest Cam Outdoor. This one's also weatherproof. And it's a symbol to install yourself. And it allows you to receive phone alerts uh, for any suspicious activity. It also saves uh, 10 to 30 days of continuous video on the cloud which is uh, really nice. And it, you can hear people and speak to people from your phone. Uh, my favorite aspects of this one would have to be that it's uh, easy to install yourself and it has um, the continuous video history on the cloud. All right, so now this will be the section about uh, smart home systems. Uh, these are more, like I said earlier, more integrated into your house rather than something you kind of just slap on there. Uh, another quote, cleaning my home is like modifying my iPhone widgets. It looks great, but I don't know where my apps are anymore. So another quote from Tony Bone, the famous reverse psychologist. That is my second major at Cal Poly. Um, yeah, I love it. All right, so this one's the ADT Pulse. Uh, you can use your phone to arm the system, lights, live footage, and garage doors. It has a smartwatch compatibility. Uh, allows you to control small appliances or set the temperature in your house, connected to Alexa. Uh, it also has uh, smart smoke and carbon monoxide detectors so you, uh, to monitor your house 24 uh, seven. If I had this system, I would probably use the Alexa voice commands. Um, instead of the smoke alarm, I'd have it play Despacito. So I know not to go slowly when evacuating my burning house. Yeah. Uh, this will be the Z-Wave. Uh, there's uh, um, sensors, bulbs, and plug communication. So wherever you plug it in your house, it'll be able to uh, communicate with each part of the system. It uses less power than Wi-Fi. It has a larger range than Bluetooth. It uses low energy radio waves and operates on a 800 and 900 megahertz frequency range. So um, 
One system I didn't include on this talk is called the Zigbee, which operates on 2.4 gigahertz, which is actually not that great because uh, it could have some interference from uh, Wi-Fi signals. So the benefit of the Z-Wave is that it lacks a lot of interference issues. And I'd say my favorite thing, especially as a CPE, is the low power. Just in general, you, uh, you like any sort of electronics that have low power dissipation. So um, this is really nice. And now, CS and SC majors beware. This portion will make some of you scared, maybe cry, pee your pants, the following will be a, uh, the general basics of how an electronic security system works. Another quote, even the power of the gods requires current and voltage, 2021, next year. Okay, so these are the basics. Um, you won't be seeing any weird quotes for a while, but they will be coming up. So uh, this, the basic electronic security system is one where the system's actions are heavily dependent on the electronic circuitry. So some simple examples of electronic, of these kinds of systems would be electronic doorbells, electronic mouse traps, keypad door locks, domestic burglar alarms, et cetera. So these are, uh, this figure one has some basic uh, elements within them. Um, here, one or more danger sensing units uh, are placed in front of the system and generate some, some sort of electrical output when there's some danger. Now, uh, the output of the sensor unit uh, connects, is fed to a data link that then goes to a decision-making signal processing unit. And then this one's uh, information, this output is fed to another data link that goes to a danger response unit, such as an alarm or some sort of electromechanical trigger or shutdown device. And then um, note how in this diagram, there's each unit has its own power supply. But um, in real life, it, it's very likely that each of these units would use, uh, would share the same power supply. All right, so um, from this, from figure two up to figure five, which I'll show you later, um, there are four different low to medium complexity types of security systems. So in this one, this would be, uh, the type of system you'd see for some, like either an electronic doorbell or a shop entry alarm system. So there's this danger sensor over here, um, which has a push button or switch um, in the case of a doorbell system, or some sort of door mounted micro switch or like a pressure mat in the case of if it was a shop entry system. So in both cases, the circuit action is such that when uh, this S1 closes, it activates a timing generator that turns on an, al an alarm sound generator uh, for about 10 seconds, um, irrespective of how long this is closed. And then it repeats this action every time S1 gets closed. So um, ideally, this type of circuit draws zero quiescent current. What is quiescent current? Quiescent current is defined as like a, an amount of current that is used in an integrated circuit when uh, in a quiescent state. What is a quiescent state? A uh, quiescent state is a, any period of time where the circuit is either in a no load or non switching condition, but it's still enabled. Um, Note in the case of a doorbell circuit that the, the danger sensor is actually activated voluntarily. So for example, you go to someone's house, you press the doorbell, it's like the person activating that sensor is, it's done voluntarily um, by the unknown visitor. So with the deliberate effort of attracting the attention of the person in the house. Um, but if this was a shop entry system, then this would be activated involuntarily uh, by the visitor. So it warns the shopkeeper, oh, there's a, there's a customer or maybe there's a thief. Um, so yeah, that's how those work. All right, so this figure shows a simple domestic burglar alarm circuit. So here, the main alarm system is enabled by closing a switch two, S2. And the, um, in this case, the S1 danger sensor actually consists of any number of uh, series connected normally closed switches. So um, they, they're made of usually like read or magnet type switches, uh, which I'll go through what those are later on in the talk. And so each of those is wired to some to a protected door window, so that um, this switch will open 
when any protected door or window is opened or if there's a break in the wiring of this switch. So under this condition, the R1 resistor will pull up the input of the low pass filter. And after a brief delay, usually about like 200 milliseconds, the filter output triggers the five minute timing generator, which turns on a relay RLA through this uh, transistor and it activates an external alarm bell or a siren via uh, these RLA contacts. Um, so when it's, once it's activated, the relay and alarm turn off automatically at the end of a five minute period, but um, it can be turned off or reset anytime with this key switch. Uh, and if you wanted to test the system, there's this S3 switch um, that you can test without closing um, S2 or closing S2, it doesn't matter. All right, so this one would be for a PIR or passive infrared movement detector system. So this is kind of like, you know, like if you ever pass by someone's house and their lights turn on all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, you know, that's a basically like what this is like. So um, it, can, it can be used to automatically sound an alarm or just turn on floodlights when someone enters the field. So the field is about, uh, it usually has a maximum range of 12 meters and a vertical span of 15 degrees and then like a horizontal span of like 90 to 180 degrees. So the way that it works is that it detects small amounts of infrared radiation generated by human body heat, but it only triggers the alarm output when a heat source moves significantly within the detection field. So um, most of these units have a good immunity to false alarms. Um, so sometimes they'll, they'll incorporate some sort of output relay that's normally just turned on and then it um, turns off when an intruder is detected or the unit's power supply fails or removed. So like the thing that gets turned off is basically the false alarm thing. So when it gets turned off, then it just reacts to whatever uh, sort of stimulus that comes within the field of detection. So, yeah, these, uh, the ones that have that sort of false alarm uh, usually need like a 12 volt DC supply and use like a quiescent current of 20 milliamps. Yeah, so a lot of these are used, uh, they're widely used to give room or area protection in a lot of modern uh, burglar alarm systems. All right, so uh, in this figure, it shows a simplified form of the wireless burglar alarm system. So um, these are RF or radio frequency data links between each of the major parts of the system. And uh, they usually um, are like 418 megahertz or 458 megahertz signal. So it eases uh, installation problems. So this is the heart of the system, the control panel has a power pack uh, mini siren wireless receiver. And so uh, this has an output to like an alarm unit. Um, most of these sorts of systems can be used uh, to monitor a maximum of four to six zones or like individually protected areas uh, with different sensing units. So um, the types of sensing units come in three different types. So there's uh, the contact switch type. Um, and it transmits a danger signal when uh, one or more series connected switches are open. And it can be used to protect any zone of the desired size. Um, so, the, so for example, with the passive infrared uh, system, they transmit a danger signal when someone moves in the field division of the unit, of the PIR unit, and uh, protects a, a zone of like a limited size, right? Um, and then this one is the panic transmitter. So these transmit a danger signal when a key fob or unlock button is pressed. And they can be used to protect a person against any sudden like physical threat or attack whenever they're within a communication range of the receiver or the control panel unit. Um, so all of these different uh, types of sensing units will send out monitoring signals that give warnings of a uh, failing battery power or some sort of deliberate uh, signal interference. And yeah, so the wireless uh, burglar alarm system allows a decent amount of security through those systems. 
So uh, these are just uh, the two figures that I showed you earlier. Note that um, both of these can actually be built easily and cheaply on a DIY basis. So that's pretty cool. Um, but some of the ones I show you will not be so easy to DIY. Yeah. So, um, so these circuits, like for the PIR and the wireless burglar alarm system, um, oh, are people talking in the chat? Let me check really quick. Okay. See, does the wireless burglar system automatically ignore signals from or kick off unidentified devices? So uh, the burglar system doesn't, it receives the signal. It depends what kind of system it is. So if it's the kind of system that, um, that has that sort of false alarm check, then it will probably ignore it. Um, but if there is an inter if there is a significant amount of interference, then it will, um, it won't kick it off and it'll alert, it'll create an alert signal. Yeah, um, yeah feel free to stop me or uh, type in the chat if you have any questions anytime. Um, so for these uh, in figure four and figure five, the PR and wireless burglar alarm systems, it's not really cost effective or technically legal to build these as a DIY. Um, because so for the um, PIR, you actually, it actually be kind of hard to build it. It's like, it would be really expensive and you have to get like all these sorts of uh, permissions to be able to make it. So for the um, RF transmitters, like in this uh, data link, these have to be certified by an approved state or national body for you to be able, even be able to access these. Um, so the PRR units and the wireless burglar alarm units can easily be used as like special elements that can be incorporated in a DIY system, given that you have the right permissions or uh, can't afford it, but you would, it'd be really uh, difficult for you to build it yourself. That's the gist of it. All right, so security system reliability. Uh, as you guys know, the most important parameter of any practical security system is the, its reliability in performing its designated task. Specifically, all of these systems have to be easy to use and difficult to disable and have a good immunity against malfunctioning uh, and generation of false alarms. Um, because, you know, it's going to quickly destroy the user's confidence in that security system if they fail these checks. All right, so uh, the security system reliability, the degree and types of reliability vary with the level of security that the system that the system that the system is designed to provide. So, for example, in uh, domestic burglar alarm systems, um, in which only a few family members have access to the major functional parts of the system, it has very low anti-tamper requirements. I know that sounds bad. Like, you know, shouldn't my burglar alarm system in my house have like high requirements for it? But because only a few people really will be interacting with that system at a time, on average, uh, it has low requirements. But anti-burglary system anti systems used in large shops and stores in which the public has access to a lot of uh, protected areas during opening hours, uh, they have high levels of anti-tamper requirement because so many people are constantly uh, coming into contact with these areas, so they need to they need to be able to uh, have a high level of anti-temper equipment. So overall, the reliability of any electronic security system is really influenced by the nature of its major system elements. So like, for example, it's a danger sensing unit, it's a data links, et cetera. All right, so um, in this part, there are simple electromechanical danger sensors. So like, there, uh, okay, still later on, I'll talk about read switches and pressure pad switches. They have a greater intrinsic value, level of reliability than electronic sensors, such as ultrasonic, microwave, and simple light beam intrusion, intrusion detectors. Oh, stop. I need to look at chat more. Let's see, is it because of the frequencies? I'm assuming yes. I don't, I don't know what you asked it for, but. I think probably, they yeah. asked when you were talking about, um... The difficulty DIYing 
the system? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it does have to do with the frequencies because there's, um, so in the allowed radio frequencies, basically a government body designates how much of that can be used um, by like amateur radio, et cetera. So um, yeah, because those RF frequencies can go outside of the allowed range, um, it it is that that is why it's harder to DIY it yourself, D, do it yourself yourself. Yeah, um, yeah. Okay, so yeah, the uh, reed switches and um, the pressure pad switches, for example, have larger intrinsic levels of reliability than ultrasonic, microwave, simple light beam intrusion detectors. And I'll go into that in a second. Um, but electronic keypad security switches are more reliable than mechanical key switches that they're actually designed to replace and so on. So um, all of the electronic security systems consist, as shown in this figure right here, of one or more danger sensing units. Um, they generate some sort of electrical output when there's some sort of danger, and they feed the output to the data link and then uh, to the decision making, and then they um, and then the danger response unit creates some sort of alarm. It wait, hold on. This one transmits to the data link to another danger response unit uh, to a danger response unit such as like an alarm or some sort of trigger or some sort of uh, shutdown device. So apart from the actual signal processing unit, um, the three major elements in any electronic security system, just to reiterate, would be the uh, sensing unit, the data link, and the response unit. So this is basically the bread and butter um, of these sort of any security system. So if you killed the power to the decision-making unit, would that prevent the um, danger response unit from doing anything? Uh, yes, and that's, that's mostly why in practical cases, the each unit would probably share power supplies because it's kind of like it should all work or it doesn't. And usually um, this is like a very basic setup. So in like more advanced setups, there will be some, like in the ones I showed you before, uh, there will be times where a secondary alarm will be triggered when the power gets cut off to the primary system. Yeah. All right, so I'll talk about um, some electromechanical sensors. So here are some uh, simple switches. Uh, these are most widely used in micro electromechanical sensors. Um, and our ordinary electrical switches of various types. So um, this one is called a, a normally open or no push button switch. Uh, this one's called an NC or a normally closed push button switch. This one, SPST stands for a uh, single throw, single pull. SPDT is a single pull throw because there's two. Um, or it's also called change over toggle switch. Um, then this one's called a single pole, single pole four-way rotary switch. Rotary because it rotates. Yeah. So in this figure, um, it shows three basic ways that a uh, normal electrical switch um, in power or signal can be used in switching applications. So in this first one, um, this is a SPST single pole single throw switch it is used as an on-off controller. Um, to switch power to a single load, right? And then in the second one, this one's a power distributor. This would be a uh, one pole three-way switch, um, which can uh, choose, it, it distributes the switch power to different loads. And then this one would be a power selector. So it can connect one of any three power sources to a single load. Um, so yeah, these are these different sensors are available in a variety of basic types. Um, including uh, temperature sensitive thermostats, uh, orientation sensitive tilts, um, tip over switches, pressure sensitive mat switches, uh, key operated security switches. So, so on and so forth. I will go over them in the following slides. So this one's a thermostat uh, switch. So this one, uh, they're temperature activated, of course. 
on off switches that usually work on uh, this uh, bimetal principle shown in figure A. So in this bimetal strip, it has two bonded layers of a conductive metal um, with different coefficients of thermal expansion. So uh, when, depending on the temperature, the strip can bend in proportion to it to make or break physical and electrical contact with a fixed switch constant which are with a fixed switch constant at a specific temperature. So then in uh, B and C, these are just signals, I mean symbols that are used to represent fixed and variable thermostats. So a, very, a variety of different types of these are readily available and um, used are, are used in automatic temperature control or like danger warning applications such as like uh, detecting fire or frost. Um, the main disadvantage is that they suffer from hysteresis. So what hysteresis is is a it's a value, the value of a physical prop, the value of the physical property lies behind the effect causing it. So it's kind of like it depends on the history of the system. So um, for example, a good quality adjusted thermostat may stay closed when the temperature rises to uh, 21 degrees Celsius but it won't be able to reopen again until it falls to 19.5 degrees Celsius. So it just depends on whatever the temperature was before, uh, before it reacts. It's almost like a delay. All right, so these are tilt switches. So the way that you kind of can kind of think about them is like if you think of like a bowl with like a certain amount of liquid in there and um, it has a different type of way that it operates depending on which way it's tilted. And it's like um, the one on the left is more like a shallow bowl or like let's say you tilted it too far to the left or to the right, then it's going to start overflowing. So you can think of the overflowing, it doesn't actually like overflow, but you can think of it as once it reaches a certain tilt, um, it changes the way that the um, switch, um, switch works. So um, this is the first one, the mercury tilt switch. And so it has this cigar shaped cavity that is formed within a block made of uh, two electrically connected metal end contacts and a central metal contact, um, which are separ separated by insulating sections. So the cavity holds a mercury globule, which rests on the central contact, but is insulated from the end contacts um, when the switch is horizontal. But it but rolls and touches one or the other ends if the switch is tilted significantly. And so in this case, because it's like you can think of it like a shallow bowl, if it tilts more than 10 degrees out of the horizontal, um, then it'll like um, it'll activate some sort of thing because it's a switch, right? So the mercury switch is normally open but closes when tilted. So it can be used to activate an alarm when an attempt is made to move something that's normally stationary. So you could attach this sort of thing to like a, a TV or a PC um, because usually that's just stationary. It's just going to be like this. So then it can, this switch can activate an alarm if it's even tilted like a little bit. Yeah. So the mercury itself acts as a contact or as a, a conductor? Uh, I believe so. Yes. All right, so now this one's on the right is the mercury tip over switch. So this one is very similar to this one. It's just that it's more if it's not as much for something where uh, it can be tilted a little bit and it's fine. So for example, um, a common application of this type of switch is in a freestanding electric heater where the switch is built into the unit and it's wired in series with its power lead. So the appliance automatically turns off if you accidentally knock it over. Like, so once it passes about like 40 degrees out of the vertical position, then it knows, oh, it's been tipped over, time to turn it off, you know, so you don't burn your house down and Despacito doesn't play on your smoke alarm. All right, uh, these are some pressure mat switches. Uh, these illustrate the general appearance and basic construction of a pressure mat switch. Um, it's designed to be hidden under like a mat or carpet. Um, and it acts as a normally open switch that closes 
if a person steps heavily on any part of the switch. So it's literally like in Minecraft that, you know, the pressure plate, yeah. Um, so the device consists of two sheets of metal foil that are normally held apart by a perforated sheet of like foam or plastic, a foam plastic. Um, this sandwich is encased in a hermetically sealed, hermetically sealed just means airtight, uh, plastic envelope. So when someone presses, steps on the envelope, uh, their weight compresses the foam plastic and the metal foils make electrical contact via the foam sheets perforations. So um, these are widely used in domestic and commercial burglar alarm systems. Uh, most switches like this have four uh, output wires. Uh, the two switch wires have a partly bared ends, which like mean like the wires are kind of going like this. Um, the other two wires aren't bared, they're internally shorted and um, they serve as like an anti-tamper function in which if that uh, wiring is cut, the alarm system activates and it can be ignored in most uh, domestic applications. All right, so on the bottom left, this is a key switch. It shows a symbolic representation of a simple key operated uh, SPST, single pulse, single throw switch, in which the switch arm is moved um, by turning a Yale type a key in a, in a matching tumbler mechanism. So like a Yale type, you know, it kind of has like that rounded end usually. Um, yeah. So switches of this basic type are available in many different uh, switch and key type styles. And they're usually uh, widely used in security applications in uh, buildings and vehicles and, and um, such things as like uh, PCs and burglar alarm control units. The most um, important parameter of a key switch is it's a number or it differs or like possible key profiles. Basically like how many different ways the key profile can be created. So um, the Yale type switches typically have uh, a number of pins, usually like about five, which have to be raised to a certain level by the key to allow the switch to operate. So usually each pin, so there's five pins and each pin has three possible levels. So it's like, I mean, I'm not going to do the math, but yeah. Um, and a simple five key thus has, uh, let's see, like maybe 243 differs. Yeah. If the key's shaft also carries two long grooves that have to match like the face plate, like, you know, like the grooves on the side, um, then it raises the number of like possible differs to like over 2,000. It's over 2,000. All right. And then lastly, these are. Uh, time switches. This is a symbolic representation of an SPST electric switch um, in which the switch arm is moved by a uh, mechanical clockwork or like slow release, um, or it's either mechanical and electrical or uh, electromechanical timing mechanism. So switches of this kind of type are, are available in many different switch styles with different timing ranges and they're usually used in light switching or solenoid operating security apps. All right, now we get to the read switches. So I mentioned earlier that it's a type of electromechanical switch that's more reliable than electronic sensors because um, it's more likely to be directly involved with the action um, than the electronic sensor, which may or may not receive the signal. So one of the most useful types of switch output electrical mechanical sensor devices is the switch, uh, which activates in the presence of a suitable magnetic field, uh, which is useful in, prox in proximity detect applications. So in this, in this figure, yeah, this shows like the basic structure of the read switch with a springy pair, like the springy thing right here, um, with uh, low resistance contacts, and it's sealed in a glass tube with protective gases. So magnetic fields usually hold their contacts apart so they can act like an open switch but these uh, fields can be molded or reversed by placing the reeds within an externally generated magnetic field so um yeah like in this in b right here this you put it next to the magnet and um when you do that the reed acts as a closed switch so um basically it can be activated by placing it within an external magnetic field, which can be derived from either an electronic coil um, or in like in, in this part right here, or by a permanent magnet 
placed within a few millimeters away. All right, so this is a bit more about the read switches. Uh, read delays are, this, are used in the same way as normal relays, but typically have a drive current sensitivity 10 times greater than the standard relay. Um, here, the read switch is embedded in a door or window frame, and the activating magnet is embedded adjacent to it in the actual door or window so that it changes state whenever the door or window is open or closed because the magnet is within uh, the door or window. Um, it can also be used to activate an alarm circuit whenever the door is open or closed, and it can be encapsulated in special um, housings that can be screwed or embedded in the body of the window. Yeah. All right, so these are basic alarm switching circuits. So here's a series switched alarm circuit, which is the alarm bell. Um, they're wired in series, and the alarm sounds only when all three are closed at the same moment. Um, in B, they're wired in parallel, um, which makes it so any switch, as long as one switch is closed, uh, the alarm will sound. Uh, these are, this is another one, which is uh, used in combination with some uh, in parallel and in series. Um, so as long as one of these is closed, and um, so if this one's closed, then um, it can be activated by the key switch. Um, but if this one's closed, well, I guess both of them would have to be closed. Yeah, if both of them are closed, then this one would be activated. All right, and I'll be going through some really quickly electrical sensor devices. So these are uh, thermistors. They're uh, passive resistor devices with a resistance value that's highly sensitive to the temperature of the device. So it's not like a um, light sensitive or resistor. Yeah, this is just dependent on temperature. So um, they're available in broad, <laughs> rod, disc, and bead forms with either positive or negative temperature coefficients. So these are just two different symbols that you can use uh, for to display what a thermistor is in a circuit. And these usually operate within a range of negative 40 degrees Celsius to 125 degrees Celsius. Uh, these are thermocouples. Um, in A, this just shows, uh, this denotes a normal thermocouple. Um, but in some special types of thermocouple devices, the junction can be heated through a DC or a RF current passed through a pair of input terminals. And the unit's output can then be used to indicate the magnitude of the input or current power. Um, and units of this type are shown like this in figure uh, 17B. All right, these are light dependent resistors. Uh, these are passive resistance devices that vary depending on visible light intensity. So this figure just shows this is the symbol and this is the basic structure for how it is. Um, it consists of a pair of metal film contacts uh, separated by this snake-like track of light-sensitive light sensitive cadmium sulfide. Uh, and the structure is housed in like a clear plastic or resin case. Um, yeah. And then here's a graph. Look at this graph. Um, LDRs have many practical applications in security and auto control systems. Uh, in this figure, it shows the typical photoresistive graph that applies to an LDR with a face diameter of uh, 10 millimeters. Yeah. Um, the resistance may be several mega ohms under dark conditions, um, falling to about, um, like, I think 900. Yeah, something like that. All right, and lastly in this section, microphones. This is the very last, I just put pictures of microphones. So yeah, it's no more circuit diagrams. Um, microphones are acoustic to electrical transducers and have a number of uses in eavesdropping and other security applications. Uh, the three best known types of electrical microphones are the moving coil or dynamic, the ribbon, and the piezoelectric crystal types. Um, in most uh, security electronics applications, microphones are required to be small but sensitive that generate uh, medium fidelity outputs or um, and electronic electric microphones are widely used in these sorts of applications. All right, and now 
Here's where things get spicy. These are the flaws within security systems. So yeah, we're in the we're in the home stretch. So yeah. A wise man once said, if you didn't know, well now you know. Antoine Bonnet, French cybersecurity expert. Yeah. All right. So simply safe. Apparently, this security system can be fooled by a cheap wireless transmitter. Why? So um, in my in my uh, sources, like at the very end of my slides, there's a link to an Amazon page where you can buy it this wireless emitter for 25 bucks. So they probably patched it, but I mean, assuming they didn't, it'd be really cheap to mess with the uh, uh, contact sensors. So in the SimpleSafe system, back in, I think it was 2017, 2018, um, this wireless emitter, this affordable wireless emitter mimics the frequency of the contact sensors on doors and windows. Um, and this uh, YouTuber lockpicking lawyer uh, even has a video on how you would do it, like step by step. So here are the parts in a basic package for a simple safe system. Uh, there's the base station with uh, wireless comms and uh, with other parts of the system and the outside world through Wi-Fi and cell links, uh, the keypad, which is the UI of the system, sensors for entry and motion, a small keypad, which is just an alternate means of arming disarming the system. Concerns arise, wake up, between communication and sensors and the base station. So a simple Google search will bring up the company's FCC filings. So it shows that these sensors transmit to the base station at 433 megahertz. And now this is important for a couple of reasons. Reason number one. Many consumer electronics use this frequency, such as car remotes, uh, garage door openers, baby monitors, weather stations, and it's also in the middle of amateur radio allocation. So amateur radio allocation is just anything that's not um, like the radio, like the radio, like it's just like, you know, ham radio, that's an amateur radio allocation. So here's the emitter, it's uh, 25 bucks on Amazon, it transmits 433 megahertz at five watts, um, and it's important because the home sensors operate on low power. Remember I was saying like a lot of systems, um, home security systems use low power. Um, so sometimes even in these systems, the base station will not receive the signal because it's low power. But with this, uh, this little device, the side button can shower out five watts of power at 433 megahertz and it can potentially interfere with every system on a block. So you might be thinking, that sounds very illegal. And it is, but if you're a burglar, you don't care. Yeah. So uh, when you press the button and you open the door, the alarm code will not be prompted. And uh, sometimes the system, the simple safe system will detect another device interfering, but it won't set off an alarm. Uh, but you can get a text alert if you have that enabled. So this was the TV home alarm system, another one. It's um, not as bad as the previous one, but the way this one works is if there's a door where there's a top and bottom, and um, if you open, if you have both of these on the top and bottom, if you open one, uh, it's it's fine. But we'll open the other one, it's fine. We'll at the same time, the signals will interfere with each other. It's pretty bad. All right. Lastly, is the ring doorbell, and is this a flaw in the system? We'll see. Anthony's like, tell him the story. And then Tony's like, okay. So, yeah. So, in uh, December 17, I'll tell you guys the story. In December 17, 2019, a family in Prince George County, Virginia said the Ring home security system was hacked by a stranger making inappropriate comments towards their kids and nanny. And he was all like, I'm in your house now. It's Mickey Mouse. Mickey's in the house. But Mickey was not, in fact, in the house. Uh, the ring doorbell, uh, according to BuzzFeed, which I don't normally use, but in this case, it was actually a decently reliable source for this information. Logging credentials for 3,672 ring camera owners were compromised. And so those login passwords, time zones, names of, of locations in the house that they have in place. So they'll know if it's in the bedroom or the front door where people usually put those. Um, and they get the hackers have access to live cam footage on all cams, access to the cloud history, 
Um, and Ring claims that they didn't have a data breach. And they said that it's usually bad actors that obtain data from other data breaches that are able to access this information. So it turns out it wasn't really hacked through any elaborate means. What uh, really happened was that the, um, the people who use the Ring alarm system use the same passwords for other accounts in which their information was leaked. So then these bad actors actually did use it on these ring doorbells and they had all this information. So basically they didn't use different passwords or password manager, which leads to the very last section, general safety tips. Uh, this is just general, not just for your house, it's general safety tips. Don't use the same password for every account. Use a password manager. I use the one on Chrome, I think it's fine. Um, you can also use signs from other companies' home security systems. So like if you had like one, like that was yours, just ditch that one and get a different one. So burglars don't know what home security system you're using. Always use two-factor authentication when you can. Use a physical hardware key. Check haveibeenpwned.com for any data breaches. And um, like you put your email in and the website tells you um, if your email has been compromised on a website. And yeah, so here are my sources and thank you for coming. Yeah.